Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, uh, we, we all noted with great interest the, the shift in the Fed's uh, focus, the acceleration of the tapering, and the indication that FOMC members expect now a series of interest rate increases this year. I'm trying to understand uh, where this leads to, and I wonder if you could comment on um, the fact that if we had three or even four 25 basis point increases in overnight rates, we would still, in my view, have a very accommodative stance with negative real short-term rates. Do, is it your view that it's realistic to bring inflation back to the target level if short-term interest rates are negative, uh, real rates? So I the, the way I would look at it is this. What we have now is a mismatch between demand and supply. We have very strong demand in areas where, where supply is constrained, particularly around goods, particularly around things like cars. So um, we have to, how are, the, how are those two things going to get into better, better into alignment? Well, part of the answer is going to be through shifts in demand, and, and we think that, we'll, that part of it will be through the return of greater supply. So I, I don't think we, we look to get all of the um, realignment between demand and supply through the demand channel, although we should get some. But at the same time, we do think we'll get over the course of this year uh, return to normal supply conditions. And that's going to affect our policy. I, I will say, though, if, you know, if, if, if we see inflation persisting at high levels longer than expected, then, then we will, you know, then we'll, if we have to raise interest rates more over time, we will. We will use our tools to get inflation back, and, and the main reason is this, uh, a reason is this, that to get the kind of uh, very strong labor market we want with high participation, it's going to take a long expansion. We can see that participation is moving only very slowly, and to get a long expansion, we're going to need price stability. Right. And so in, in a way, high inflation is, is, a, is a severe threat to the achievement of maximum employment and to achieving a long expansion that can give us that. Uh, I think that's a very important point. Let, let me also just ask you, um, as I mentioned, I understood the need for quantitative easing, the extraordinary measures that we're taking during the crisis. But I worry that the Fed's decision to continue to use these policies well after the crisis had passed, and in fact, we're in the midst of a strong recovery, increases the risk of normalizing behavior like this bond buying. So I think it's your view that it's important that this not become normal routine uh, part of Fed behavior. Um, but could you clarify that? And if it is important that this not become a routine matter, how do we ensure that it doesn't? So I, I guess I would start by saying that the, the last two uh, downturns have, there's been nothing normal about them. It's, they've been his, two historically large uh, downturns, one being the global financial crisis and one being the pandemic. And we did, we were called to use, to invent new tools and use all of our tools. Um, if we had a, so really if we had a regular way recession, a couple of quarters of negative growth, a typical um, recession, then the question would be, what do we need to do? And so in this era of, of very low interest rates, there's not going to be as much room to cut, but that would be the first thing that we would do. Now, the, the, as just because we, are, we, we have been uh, and probably remain in an era of very low interest rates, we would have to look at asset purchases as the next tool in line, but we wouldn't, I don't think we'd automatically use it unless it was necessary. I would certainly hope we wouldn't automatically use it. I would hope that there would be a very, very high threshold to get over, um, especially when you consider the ways in which it distorts um, uh, the allocation of capital. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, one of the things I'm very concerned about is the, uh, especially the regional banks having strayed from the Fed's statutory mission on monetary policy into inappropriate and overtly political advocacy. It's one of many, many examples. The Boston Fed conducted a virtual event as part of its Racism and the Economy series in which the speakers routinely and adamantly called for defunding the police, which has nothing to do with the Fed's mandate. For seven months now, I've been asking for information from several regional banks about their political activism, and for seven months, they have simply refused to comply with my request. So I've requested some documentation from the main Fed with respect to this activity, 
all of which, by the way, is subject to FOIA in any case. Now, I'm sure it's not your opinion that the ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee is entitled to less information than a member of the general public would get through a FOIA request. So can you commit to getting me the information that is now long overdue? So I, I am aware that, that, uh, that you have submitted a FOIA request and we're processing it now, and I, I don't know what's asked for. I don't know whether it's actually covered by FOIA, but to the extent that it is, you'll, of course, get it. Uh, I, I think it's very important that this committee and Congress uh, understand how the Fed reaches decisions to engage in political advocacy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.